Hi there! Welcome back to another video on my channel. Today I'm going to do a short intro because I'm going to make this more of like a vlog video. And um, today we're going to be going to an event that's put on by the American Writers Museum. So if you're interested in seeing all that, just keep on watching! readers, booksellers, and writers, the romance genre has never been more vibrant or powerful. Today we're going to hear from three authors of new romances about how and why they write their love stories. Claire Legrand is the New York Times best-selling author of 12 novels, including Imperium Trilogy, A Crown of Ivy and Glass, and the forthcoming A Song of Ash and Moonlight. Swan Huntley's novels include I Want You More, Getting Clean with Stevie Green, The Goddesses, and We Could Be Beautiful. Zeo Axelrod is a USA Today best-selling author of contemporary fiction and romance. Her latest books is Girls with Bad Reputations. <laughs> this panel is moderated by Pamela Knight, past president of the Chicago North Romance Writers and chair of its biennial conference. Welcome to you all. The layup on the table before they even touch the book, they can miss the book entirely. So it's really a cross discipline collaboration of trying to figure out the game that best suits players that love story, love narrative, and also want to just run and play the game and enjoy the mechanics and, and still get an overall story that, that fits what we want to tell. Um, yeah. Can I, I can also. I want to say that for the uh, Star Trek Adventures role-playing game, uh, the Shackle and Stance book, we created a writing room, um, that's what we did on Disney, so we created a writing room where we broke the story from beginning to end throughout the book, and it was like four, four or five of us, um, and we created a, a narrative that went throughout the entire book, and we did that so that players could take this um, story and go from beginning to end throughout it, and you know, to do that is just like what you do with uh, video games. So it's not just individual campaigns, but it's an overall larger story. Next program looks at how science fiction and speculative writing can build a place so real that you'll want to book a plane ticket when you're done with the book. Yeah. Darcy Little Badger is Lippin Apache writer with a PhD in oceanography. Her critically acclaimed debut novel, Alatsoe, was featured in Time as one of the best 100 fantasy books of all time. Suzanne Walker is a Chicago-based writer and editor. She's co-creator of the critically acclaimed, award-nominated graphic novel, Mooncakes. Her short fiction has been published in Clark's World and Uncanny Magazine. Moderator Michi Troida is five-time Hugo Award-winning Filipino-American writer, editor, and narrative expert. She is the executive editor at the Environmental Justice and Advocacy nonprofit Green America. A notable debut, a best selling author's newest release, and the story of a family season. 
Jessica Shatek is the New York Times best-selling author of The Women in the Castle, The Hazards of Good Breeding, a New York Times notable book, and finalist for the Penn Winship Award and Perfect Life. Yukiko Tominaga was a finalist for the 2020 Flannery O'Connor Award for Short Fiction, selected by Roxane Gay. Her first book, See Loss, See Also Love, was named a most anticipated book by the millions. Donna Hemans is the author of the novel, novels River Woman and Tea by the Sea. Her fiction and nonfiction have appeared in numerous literary magazines, including Slice, Shenandoah, Electric Literature, Miss Magazine, and Crab Orchard Review. There'll be discussion with Michael Zapata, a founding editor of Make Literary Magazine and the author of the novel Lost Book of Adana Murrow. Welcome to you all. Hi there, um, I am here the next day or the next next day um, to just kind of do a recap of everything that I learned at these different panels that we went to for the American Writers Festival. Um, I know that I put in videos of like the, the panels or like the introduction to the panels in here, but I didn't like film the whole thing. <laughs> so um, I just kind of talk, wanted to talk about like my takeaways from the different panels and like stuff I learned. So yeah, the first panel we went to was about writing a love story, and um, I went to this one because I feel like that that's something I could work on or improve on within my craft. Um, I am working on some projects um, right now that involved romantic plot lines, and um, I, I think I want to incorporate more of those in my work in the future, but it's just something that I don't have a lot of experience with. Um, I don't re read a whole lot of romance truthfully or like um I don't I don't know I I've been reading it more recently and I do like the encyclopedia of fairies um that one is a romance and I do like that one quite a bit um but it's got like other stuff going on but I know like romance is like and romance is like a huge genre especially like post pandemic and um I have a lot of colleagues that write romances dark romances whatever um but I'm just not normally the consumer of that content. Also, I just think I'm like, I have this weird personality where it's like, you know, I've experienced love and um, I am married and I've been having a romantic relationship with my partner for close to 10 years now. Um, so I've experienced that for myself. It's not like I'm inexperienced, um, but I just feel like, um, I don't know, I, I, maybe I'm judgy. <laughs> Because, like, I see the way certain romantic relationships are portrayed in media, TV, um, like, books and stuff. And sometimes they, like, miss the mark for me or they, like, promote things that I don't necessarily agree with. And um, so it's hard. Some of it's, like, straight up toxic, too. And it's, like, I worry, like, what's the line between, you know, this is just fantasy role play for folks versus, like, what ideals are we promoting and what are we normalizing? you know that that's a huge debate so anyway romance is a tricky genre for me in general um but I wanted to learn more right so we went to the love story panel and one of the first things they said that I really appreciated is that um they were talking about love stories in the context of not just romantic love but like friendship love um found family family and I really appreciated that <laughs> because I love found family and I think for me, that's more of like a healing calling than just like a romantic relationship is, you know, because um, I know a happily ever afters and romances can be really healing for some folks who are in a dark place. Um, but for me, that's what found family does <laughs> instead. Um, and um, no spoilers, but like Curse Fate and Wicked Breed in conjunction um, 
is more of like a found family story and especially at the end of wicked breed like it ends on a happy note and i don't want to spoil it for anybody but it's like a really simple but like charming scene of um this found family coming together and having their happily ever after with one another um so i really appreciated that because then i was like okay well maybe i'm better at uh writing <laughs> this kind of stuff than i thought um and then yeah so they had like romance people on this panel but they also had um people who just had romantic plots incorporated into different genres um I think my biggest takeaway that really helped me kind of put this in perspective is not thinking about like the romantic relationship itself, but thinking like, what does my protagonist need to learn? Yeah, what does my protagonist need to learn? And how can they learn it through this relationship or through this romantic partner? Um, another person was talking about like, well, how should the character experience love or feel love? Like, what do they need? Like, and so, um, contextualizing it more for the development of the main character instead of just writing like oh we're in love yeah 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 which isn't bad but you know i and um, maybe this is my prejudice coming in but i was just like i i didn't have that shift in perspective yeah so maybe that was just my prejudice coming out and not thinking about it in that way in terms of character development versus just like romance for the sake of romance um i kind of been do doing that within this project i'm doing where um the main character is a widower and she is a grandmother and um, she's in her hometown and reconnecting with um, an old love. And um, basically like the plot of the book is that there's something going on and nobody's paying attention to her, listening to her because they're just writing her off as older or confused or, you know, whatever, you know, like very real, like, who putting the concerns of women in general, but especially um, older women, is a very real thing. So, um, yeah. So, basically, her romantic interest, like, the most romantic scene I have between the two of them right now is him engaging in her interests and um, listening to her and, like, her opinions and, like, what she has to say, which, like, you would think that's, like, the bare minimum. Like, the bar is literally in hell. Uh, but the, the scene itself is pretty funny and, like, like he uh okay i don't want i don't want to give too much because again like what if i don't keep the scene but i really like the scene so he is you know doing the guy thing of like trying to get to know her better uh, even though like she's kind of not initially interested in uh rekindling their relationship so he pops in on her book club at the library and the women of the book club do this thing <laughs> where if somebody wants to join and they're not necessarily wanting them to join, like, you know, in the example I use, like, pretentious, like, college lit guys or, you know, whatever. Like, it's this club of older women and it's their almost secret space, right? So, um, in order to wean, like, scare off, like, potential new members that they doesn't jive with them, uh, they, instead of using their normal book recommendations, because it's, like, a feminist book club, um, they do... <laughs> They, like, recommend, like, erotica, full-on smut, like, for their next read. And, obviously, it makes these people feel uncomfortable. Um, uh, uncomfortable, especially in the context of having to talk about uh, hardcore sex with older women, right? So, it's, like, a playful joke on a critique, again, that, like, women stop being sexual beings after a certain age, right? Or, like, that's how society perceives them. So uh, the the love interest, he's like, all right, I'll read it. <laughs> and he does. And he shows up to the next meeting with a copy of this erotica book and, like, has, like, uh, sticky notes and stuff. And it's, like, all annotated and stuff. And he is so ready to discuss. He is so excited. And um, then it turns out, like, plot twist of we're actually reading this book instead. And he's like, oh. Um, but he passes the test, right, because he sees these women as people, right? He doesn't see them as just grandmothers that they are still uh full-fledged interesting people with opinions and stuff and so in that meeting he just spends the time like listening to them and like taking notes and stuff and i feel like this is also just like me <laughs> because um i hate oh i know i know um i hate when uh the mansplaining right i hate when uh the these these uh, older straight men or, or, or men in general truthfully um come to these spaces as a guest and then take up 
time and um instead of like asking questions and being normal they like try to inject their opinions as if you know their reality is the only one that matters and i feel like because this takes place in a small town in indiana like i grew up in indiana and um south bend's not a small town by any means but i lived on the outskirts of south bend surrounded by a bunch of small towns so i was exposed to different cultures in that way uh, men do that there quite a bit <laughs> even though nobody has the qualifications to be doing so they they tend to do that quite a bit so that was my way of like being like aha look a man that listens <laughs> um god forbid you know i don't know but anyway so i think that was my example of like writing what my character needed at that time and it's literally just somebody who's supportive um but yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's not romantic to you, but that's romantic to me. And then yeah, maybe that's why I can't write romance because I don't really find the whole like, like the sex stuff for sure. Yeah. But like some of the things that are considered romance being like, oh, why are you talking to that? My girl, I'm going to sh- rough you up type shit isn't romantic to me anymore. Like that might've been romantic to me when I was a young woman <laughs> and, um, I, I don't know, but now I'm, like, almost 30, and I know that's not old, but I'm an old lady compared to a lot of my peers, <laughs> and that's just, that's just not romantic to me anymore. The threat of violence against another human being is not very sexy or romantic to me anymore. So, anyway, uh, <laughs> that's just me. Um, something else I learned that I thought was really interesting, um, there was one writer, her name was Swan, and she was talking about something that she discussed with her therapist, and I thought it was fascinating. Um, that when it comes to dating, um, everyone you date is a ghost, how, how did she say, is a ghost of your past and that you project things onto them, which I thought was fascinating. So that's another way for me to like interpret romantic relationships, right? It's more of like, how is this a reflection of, because when you date, like inevitably certain traumas come up and the deeper the relationship gets. Um, some things come up from your past or like um, just like I can only speak about being married um, or being with the same person for a significant amount of time Um, we've seen a lot of personal growth in one another and uh, drastic changes and I know um, early on in our marriage I had issues that were coming up that reminded me of uh, familial trauma and stuff like that Um, and so those manifested (laughs) great during the pandemic it was great um but I was projecting a lot of stuff onto my husband and um it took a while for us to figure out like where that was coming from why that was a thing and um working through it but that inevitably happens when you spend um (laughs) a shit ton of time with somebody that you are forming a partnership with right um because you get settled into a place that reminds you of your parents in a way I thought it was interesting because definitely like you can look at I think I do this where you can look at your exes and you see like the personal growth or like you look at your exes and you're like oh that was my sad girl era (laughs) or that was my oh my parents are going through a divorce so I need some stimulation and um poor decision making era (laughs) so anyway um that's also something to keep in mind too is like how the relationship reflects the mental state of the main character and um it's hard because again you want to see like it's a little toxic because you don't you don't want to take agency away from other characters like you don't want to like be like oh you know this boyfriend or girlfriend is only a reflection no of course they're their own separate person right but if you're like in the headspace of someone you it's hard to disentangle like of course you see them as their own individual person and like the wonderful characteristics about them and their flaws and and you're attracted to those and um like you you want to be with this person for those reasons um but like ultimately you have to ask yourself why are you attracted to certain things and so sometimes that can bring up things from the past too so yeah i'm not trying to sound like it's all egocentric like yeah relationships are involving two people but a lot of times what your relationship is like is a reflection of like uh how you think about yourself or you know what i mean i don't know i don't want to get too deep into it because i'm not a psychiatrist but i've been around the block so <laughs> that's all I'm saying. Um, but yeah, so I learned a lot on that romance panel. It was pretty good. I think in terms of like talking about writing specifically and like technique or like processes, that one was the most on the nose. Um, something that my husband noticed is that sometimes um, the panel's kind of like 
trickled away or divulged from the initial topic. And I know he expressed that frustration. It wasn't as big of a deal for me, but he expressed that frustration because he like kind of takes things like, okay, if we're going to talk about X, talk about X. It's hard for him to understand like the subtext or like how things are like connected in that way, because he's more of a literal person. Um, I am a literal person too sometimes, but because I write, I can see how people, or because I like am more people focused with my thought process, I understand that sometimes people make connections in their brain and it's easier for me to see those connections just because I've paid attention to it more, I think, than he is. He's a programmer, so he needs things to be literal. He needs, like, literal directions given to him, whereas um, I'm more of, like, an artistic person. Like, not that he's not artistic, but, like, I write, so I understand metaphors. I understand that, like, things connect for people when they don't necessarily understand how they connect or they don't even see the connection in the first place. But, you know, you kind of weave things together. You, you figure out speech patterns after a while. Um, I'm a professional rambler. So, <laughs> so like I get it. Um, but yeah, anyway, so that was a critique he had, but I feel like the Romeo's panel was the most on the nose when it came to that. So um, that was awesome. The second one we went to, we like skedaddled into there real quick was uh, writing for gaming panel. Um, gaming as in for like video games and tabletop games and uh, stuff like that. So they had um, people who were well developed in the industry or like some younger folks too. And they kind of talked more about the gaming industry as a whole, I think, more so than just like writing about. Like, yeah, but at least the parts when we got there, because we missed a couple minutes in the beginning, but they were talking about like industry projects as a whole, I think, and um, the gaming scene here in Chicago and um, how narrative in games can be uh, more interactive or it's hard to write because it's really up to the player's choices. So you have to write like a web, which is really helpful for me because I'm trying to do like a, a choose your own romance type project just for funsies. And um, with that one, you kind of have to do like a web writing because the reader is going to effectively make a decision. So um, they had softwares that they recommended that would help with that. So maybe that would be something I could employ because I don't want the options to be too static because right now it's like um, very simplistic where it's like you you read a chapter, there's two decisions, you make one or two decisions, and then it branches off that way. Um, but I would like to do something a little bit more complex potentially. Um, so we'll see. But anyway, so it's like web writing. So I, I that so is something that I wish we could have listened to a little bit more because it would have been helpful for that specific project, but that's okay. Uh, and then they talked about interactivity, especially with like um, board games. And um, yes, love is more improv and spon spontaneous, um, but it also allows people to dress up, well, not dress up, but like play pretend in a way. Like D&D &D allows people to play pretend and write their own uh, stories in real time and perform those stories for an audience in which in ways that like uh, we don't really have a lot in adulthood like when you're a kid you dress up play pretend whatever all the time right and adults still crave that um, but there's not a whole lot of uh, socially acceptable outlets for people to do that and I think D&D &D is one of them um, and again it wasn't so socially acceptable a few years ago but it's on the rise and I have a lot of reasons why I think that way but uh, again pandemic um but yeah, play is important for adults too. Play is an essential part of learning. And as a lifelong learner, you should incorporate play into your learning process whenever you can, instead of just like, you know, it's play is great because it introduces trial and error um, in ways that just reading and studying does not. Um, what else was there? I think that was more beneficial for Douglas because um, my husband did kind of start out like um, making video games in his career, like, when he was early on, and, like, he had this dream of making an independent gaming studio that didn't take off when he was younger, and so now he does a lot of corporate stuff, but, um, I think it would be good for him to network, because apparently Chicago does have an indie game development scene, um, so hopefully he'll tap into that, I don't know, but it was, I, it was informative, for sure. Okay, so, the third panel we went to was called, um, Building world building or or something i don't know it was about world building and um the panelists they had there i've actually heard of before because i've heard of their uh work before i've i've seen it out in places um but it was more for fantasy world building and at the beginning they did talk about that um you want to come up you want to come here oh my god yeah. okay um in the beginning they did talk about that right 
and um, I'm trying my best to go off of recollections. I should have done this earlier. I'm sorry. I was just so tired by the end of that day that I was like, there's no way I'm recording anything. They also talked about how um, world building, I guess the overall topic inadvertently was um, bringing perspective into world building and like how much world building is based on like what you know and like versus things you need to research. So it was really interesting because these people come from very um, different marginalized identities, but they incorporated their perspective into their own worlds. Um, so um, the one panelist was a very prominent Native American writer um, and writes about land and like their home basically in Texas and their community. And um, they incorporated like, I'm trying to remember. There's stories that they give an example of was like kind of about like fa fairy rings and um, the main character's family being able to speak with the ghosts of animals. And so not just animals, but like mosquitoes and like bugs and stuff too, um, which is interesting. And then they, they also talked about like fairy rings and like how people can use fairy rings for transportation and a, lo a lot of like interesting world building stuff. And they, um, that person in particular comes from like a very science heavy background. And so they're used to doing research and talking about like the specific biology of like animals and, and plants and stuff. And so for them, it's like, they needed to learn when to stop doing research and letting the reader kind of have their own imagination when it comes to things. Um, but also it's just uh, like too detail heavy, I guess. Well, like how can one be included enough details where it's important versus not a distraction? And like, that's something I'm working on too. That's actually qu a quotable feedback I got from an editor for one of my short stories is that sometimes uh, details can be a little bit of a distraction when it comes to pacing. Um, but anyway, so I found that to be interesting. And um, the other panelists talked about how uh, they, they have a project called Mooncakes and the main character, which in that, they, they co-created this graphic novel. And um, the main character in that is hearing impaired and um, the panelists themselves, they were he hearing impaired as well. And so they had to create a whole um, magic system that would work based off of that. Um, so I thought it was really cool and I've seen mooncakes in some comic stores before, so I might, I might pick it up. Um, but just little things like that, right? Like, and they were talking about, oh, obviously like representation and how that's important in literature and, um, how that affects your storytelling abilities, right? Or not storytelling abilities, but I mean, your, your life and your experiences shape the way you think and view the world, right? So of course, when it comes to creative projects, um, you're going to come to the table with certain ideas that other people wouldn't even consider and i think like a magic system based off of someone who needs to wear a hearing aid um is an example of that as well as um you know the the perspective of someone who has lived in the same area for so long and has this intrinsic relationship with the land with the that land and their families and and um it was really interesting because they talked about how like they made real world change kind of with their books um in their books they mentioned a plot of land that had been used, I guess, as a garbage dumping area, but it's really sad because they had like people's bodies buried there, like Native American bodies buried there. And um, that was a way for them to alliterate this like overall feeling of loss they had that like is like in this pessimism that they had um, because they're so used to seeing loss within the context of their own community and their own history. Pause has been, after that book was released, um, there was more pushes to recover that land. And so um, that land was returned to uh, the community it belongs to, and they set up a permanent like graveyard for those people um, and had that history acknowledged and yay and, and great. Um, so they made it a point to talk about how in their books, they really want to instill this idea of hope um, to younger people because they don't want to share that same pessimism of reality with younger people and like yeah it's important to go through hardships but they don't want people to feel that like overall loss like they do um, which again is another form of healing right and I, I, I thought that was really cool and I thought that was beautiful um, so yeah it kind of like talks about world building at first and then talks to people's like uh, personal experiences and then one question I thought was really interesting was about like how much do you write for yourself versus how much do you write for um, the market and it was like how do you incorporate that concept into world building itself like do you add like popular mechanics or popular tropes just because it sells well and both of them said that they kind of don't um, which okay <laughs> I know some people do 
but uh, they they said that they don't um, because they just want to make them happy, basically. Um, but I think that's an important thing to consider. And um, I know right now, like the romanticy market is super crazy. Um, I I I think the tropification of books personally is is very prominent in romance. Like they have terminologies that I never even heard of prior to doing that. And maybe I'm just like not as much of an avid reader as some of these people. I mean, I read pretty quickly, I think so. But then some some people got me beat by a lot. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I think there's ways to categorize things to help with like search algorithms and stuff. But it's like hard because then you start com- you start defining everything in like rigid boxes and stuff. And I think for creative people, it's good to just organically create, you know, it's more fulfilling. But then you also have to think about like, oh, you know, I want my, like I was talking about like my fantasy story to be technically found family. So I'm going to put that label on it because it is. Um, but then like how popular of a trope is that? What if that's not popular right now, but um, animal companions is super popular. So I got to make sure I put some animals in my book, in my world building, or, you know, um, maybe pirates aren't selling, but freaking vampires and mermaids are. So I got to change the creature's you know what I'm talking about I don't know I don't I'm just rambling again but they talked about that question and I thought that was interesting and then the last panel truthfully was a little bit of a hot mess um (laughs) but the last panel was about uh new fiction and um I don't really know how cohesive that was it was more so about the three panelists talking about their books that they wrote or that they were trying to promote and um a lot of them had something to do with their own personal experiences to an extent one book um I'm just gonna be honest right now and maybe this is me being petty or ignorant where but I don't know why she was there I don't know why she was writing that book and I don't know okay okay so basically there was one woman there and she was basically trying to intellectualize having sympathy for Nazis and the families of Nazis post-World War II um because obviously they you would hope that they would feel shame and regret um let's be for real a lot of them did not, and a lot of them continued to talk to, talk to some ish after the fact, okay? The racism didn't just go away. It's still persistent, and it's been persisting for generations, especially people who were within the descendants of Nazis. So let's be so for real about that. Her grandparents were Nazis, and then she had another set of grandparents that were Americans who were fighting against Nazis. And so she was coming from this place where she was trying to understand the emotions of both. And I think in a way she was trying to um, talk about how people can regret the horrible things they do, which is true. But it was weird because she was really trying to intellectualize her book and she was trying to bring in like different economics factors. She was talking about uh, oil for some reason I guess because you know there was a booming factor in the economy after World War II and America was positioned in the world to be um, a sort of savior nation and they were financially assisting a lot of countries that they defeated at the time and um, this new global order was imposed so yeah she was putting in a lot of IR and history stuff which you think I would enjoy because um, that was literally my degree <laughs> and uh, I so I understand the historical t- context she's trying to put in Um, But it felt like, and I don't know if she's talking about about all this in one book or just like overarching themes for her work, but it was, a lot of it was um, talking about the, the uh, loss of greatness within the U.S. (laughs) And then when she was asked like what book inspired her to start writing, uh, she brought up a poetry book. I can't remember the name. I think it was like Poetry for Colored Girls in a Rainbow World before. Or something and I've never heard of this book before but I assume it's not necessarily for her target audience or you know what I mean because like some some stuff's just not for us and that's okay like as a white woman some stuff is just not for us and that's totally okay like we you know I love Toni Morrison she's my favorite author but she's not writing necessarily like for me like she's writing within her community to express grievances that are going on in the community because of people like me and that's fine. And I think, like, the way she talked was just a lot of white woman bullshit. <laughs> and, um, like, she was like, oh, I'm just so happy everyone can be here despite, like, 
um, the world being divisive and stuff like that. So when I hear a white, white woman start with something like that, I'm like, oh God, here we go. Um, and like, obviously we're in Chicago, the crowd itself is very racially diverse. And, and that's the beauty of living in Chicago is that you got people from all over and, and different backgrounds here, different socioeconomic standings. I love this city because of that. Um, but, but I just, I feel like she was an inclusionary piece that was making choices <laughs> i don't know because i know she was there for the white people who doesn't necessarily fully understand diversity but they really want to right but they don't want to be they don't want to feel excluded from the conversation so they want to talk about their backgrounds and and we can we have to recognize that what we're doing isn't necessarily groundbreaking and it's okay to be like you know nazis were assholes racist people are assholes we don't need to like i don't need to sympathize for them and maybe that makes me sound like a dick but like, I don't, I have racist people in my family. I do not sympathize for them when they bitch and complain about things that like I, that aren't real world problems. It's just because of coming out of their own bigotry. I don't feel for them. I don't have to, they're bad <laughs> people. Um, anyway, <laughs> there was other people on this panel besides her. And, um, actually a book that Douglas and I both decided we want to do a buddy read, um, was written by this other panelist there. She's a Japanese author and, um, she wrote this story that was, uh, what was it called? Um, it was like lost sea love or sea, sea love, sea lost, sea lost, the sea love. I don't remember, but if I remember, I'm going to put a, a cover in it because it sounded so interesting. Um, where she was writing a book, obviously based on her own personal grief, like she was even getting choked up, just like kind of talking about it. And, um, the, they had the speaker there who really liked to hear himself talk. Um, <laughs> basically uh, wanted all of them to read a page of their book out loud. She was our favorite panelist by far. And her writing was so, it was simplistic, but it was funny and, and sad and just straight to the point. Like you got the book as, as soon as you got the first, the, 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 the her, whatever she chose to read aloud was gold. Um, and it was, this book's about grief, right? And the loss of a husband. And the scene she read out loud was, a mother-in-law trying to comfort her the main character who was a wife that lost her husband and these two come from two different cultural backgrounds and the main character is Japanese and I believe the mother-in-law is like American or whatever um, and she's trying to like hug her and comfort her and um, like just be physically comforting for the main character but the main character can't understand that and um, I, I'm I'm not using the appropriate language because the language she used was great. Um, but basically she was talking about how in Japanese, they don't necessarily have a, an appropriate translation for I miss you. Um, and that they just don't hug in their culture either. And so not, you, you have this instance of somebody grieving, um, but also dealing with cultural differences as well um, in a humorous way, uh, which I appreciate because, you know, my husband's from a different culture than me. He's Brazilian and I'm American. And even though our cultures are similar in a lot of ways, in a lot of ways they aren't. And so um, I understand what it's like having difficult uh, culture shocks, uh, but also in a humorous way. So I like that. Um, but her book is about grief in general. And she's talking about the five stages of grief and how at the end, when people think that they get to acceptance, they think that it's just over. And that they they beat their grief or whatever but that's not how it works and sometimes you relapse um but it's also playing around with the idea of time and how time especially when you're grieving doesn't feel the same as like time in a linear way and so the book's written to reflect that and i'm just i was just so sold right away so this is going to be on my tbr list for sure um the other panelist that spoke um was talking about um migration and the story of her own grandparents moving um around I, from what I remember, um, from the U.S. Brooklyn to Cuba, um, but also I, th I think she's Jamaican, so they were moving around quite a bit, and um, just kind of like understanding, because this was like early on, and she she was talking about um, in like I think in 1917 or whatever, and so it's like, um, of course, a, a really difficult time for anybody who's racialized as black. 
at that time, especially for migration. But it was also she was also talking about the concept of land and the concept of home and family and like what happens intergenerationally for land and how that reflects on someone's home, especially for people who move around or who are immigrants. Um, so she was talking about her own personal life and how like um, there's land back on back in the Caribbean that she could technically like claim to because um someone passed away recently and the family's trying to divide it up in their will um but you know she was there quite a bit but she lives in the u.s now um but then she's got cousins that have never been there um that are in the u.s that are trying to claim it as well and people are getting feeling some kind of way about it because they've never been there before um it's also like people necessarily can't afford their lands anymore so it's like you have a grandparents generation who work so hard to own something for the first time in their lives right especially after you know you know everything that went on back then like with slavery slavery and stuff and so this was the first time they ever like owned something or owned land or had something for themselves and they want to maintain that for generations obviously but then like with the economy how it is right now and like family feuds and stuff like that it gets divided or sold off and um you you have this legacy disintegrating and um, so that juxtaposition between moving around and wanting to be anchored to some spot uh, it was sounded super interesting too. Um, so yeah, basically that it was just examples of like their work in new fiction, which again, when I heard new fiction, I thought it was going to be something like um, like older than young adult, but like not full up. So I thought the target audience was going to be young adults because that was my concept of new fiction and. Um, when I heard those stories, they sounded like very mature topics, which again, young adults can read about, obviously. Um, but I think that I had a different understanding of what that panel was going to be like. And that kind of felt like more of a promotion for each of their books rather than like a connected theme, like some of the other panels. Um, and like, even though the, the, the moderator was like really engaging and, 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 and spoke well and was friendly, um, I felt like he talked quite a bit in comparison to other moderators because when you're a moderator, it's kind of your job to let the panelists shine. Um, and he did do that, but I just felt like um, not as much content was necessarily covered as some of the other panels just because of like how that was organized, I guess. I don't know. But those were all my thoughts about everything I saw. Obviously, there were so many panels and like they were all happening at the same time and there could have been something for everybody there. Um, but those are the ones that I chose to go to that were more related to like fiction and stuff. Um, and just to kind of help my own work out, but they had stuff on autobiographies, on history, um, on cultural writing, um, on even food and comedy in Chicago. <laughs> so they had a bunch and, um, I'm hoping that they, I, I'm sure they do this yearly. Um, and I'm hoping that we can go again next year and maybe check out some other stuff that wasn't here that we saw this time. Um, because obviously there's so much to see in so little time. But yeah, I hope that you like this video. I hope, you know, it's not too long and you enjoyed um, my feedback for this event, I guess. I don't know. Um, but if you're in Chicago, check it out. It's free to go to these panels at the library. And uh, it's, it's a great resource for the community and libraries are awesome. So yeah, if you like this video, feel free to like it comment down below, share it with a friend, or subscribe to the channel. Please, please, please. That would help me out a lot. Um, I tend to post weekly, and um, a lot of my content right now is about books and writing, but I also do um, stuff about my hobbies too, which is like makeup and Pokemon and uh, video games. And I'm hoping to do make another makeup video here for you soon. So be on the lookout for that. Yeah. And until next time, thanks. Bye.